Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to join you all for this important conversation this afternoon. I want to begin with sharing an experience I had recently, just a few weeks ago, in Memphis, Tennessee. I was in Memphis for the commemoration of the terrible events 50 years ago where Dr. King was assassinated. I was at the National Civil Rights Museum, which if you haven't been, you should get there. It's in the Lorraine Motel, the very motel where Dr. King stayed and where he was killed. And the purpose of the events around Dr. King's assassination were to reflect on his legacy and to reflect on the progress we have made and the progress still to make these 50 years later. But I want to start by reflecting on actually what Dr. King said the day before he was assassinated. He gave a speech called, I've been to the mountaintop. And in that speech, Dr. King really foresaw his untimely death. He talked about the fact that I'm, as he said, I might not get there with you, but we will get to the promised land. His goal that night was to talk to a diverse crowd, young and old, white and black, about the plight of sanitation workers in Memphis. And the goal for the sanitation workers was to get better wages and better living conditions. And Dr. King's challenge in that speech was to try to get this diverse coalition, that over a thousand people who he was speaking to, who had not themselves been sanitation workers, to get them to put themselves in the situation of a sanitation worker, to see their fate as bound up with the fate of that sanitation worker next to them. He talked that night about what it takes to be resolute in the face of resistance. He talked about the experience of the civil rights activists in Birmingham who had overcome dogs and fire hoses, slurs and physical abuse, who had chosen to march on in the face of that resistance for justice. And he called on this audience to see the same opportunity to march on for justice for the sake of these sanitation workers. He called on them, as he had done in the letter from a Birmingham jail, to think about the idea that we are all caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied together in a single garment of destiny. Dr. King then talked about the story we all know well of the Good Samaritan, who'd stopped on the road to Jericho to help another man. And he talked about that the Good Samaritan could have asked the question, if I stop, what will happen to me? But instead, the Good Samaritan asked the question, if I don't stop, what will happen to this man? And Dr. King called on this community of people to put themselves on the line for the sake of the sanitation workers. He talked about the need for unity for the cause of justice and progress. He told that audience, Either we go up together or we go down together. So that's what I want to talk about today in the context of schools in Michigan. This theme that either we go up together or we go down together. That all of our fates are bound up together. And I want to argue that it's in schools that we will decide whether we go up together or down together. I believe that deeply and personally because of the difference school made in my own life. I'm standing here today only because of New York City public school teachers who saved my life. I grew up in Brooklyn. Both my parents were New York City public school educators. Both my parents died when I was a kid. My mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. And I lived during the time after my mom passed with my dad, he was struggling with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. So home was this place where I didn't know what my father was gonna be like from one night to the next. I didn't know if he was gonna be mad, if he was gonna sad, be sad, if he was gonna talk to me or not. I can recall one night he woke me up at two in the morning, told me it was time to go to school. I remember saying to my father as I clung to the banister on the staircase of our house, and he pulled me on the stairs. I remember saying to him, no, Daddy, it's not time to go to school. It's the middle of the night. And didn't understand why he was acting that way. That's what home was like day after day. 
But I was blessed to go to New York City public schools where I had teachers who made school this place that was amazing, engaging, interesting, compelling, safe, and supportive. I had a teacher, Mr. Osterall, he's my teacher in fourth, fifth, sixth grade. In his class, we read the New York Times every day. I always say he was doing college and career ready standards before we called them college and career ready standards. We did productions of Midsummer Night's Dream and Alice in Wonderland. I was the rose in Alice in Wonderland. Imagine me with big red felt petals sticking out of my head. <laughs> but he, he made this cl his classroom a place where I could be a kid when I couldn't be a kid outside of school. And I was blessed to have a series of teachers in New York City Public Schools who could have looked at me and said, here's an African-American Latino male student, family in crisis, what chance does he have, and given up on me. But instead, they chose to see possibility and opportunity and to invest in me. That's why I'm standing here today, and that's why I believe the challenge for Michigan around improving education is so fundamental. Teachers saved my life. Teachers in schools, just as you heard on this last panel, teachers in schools in Detroit are saving lives every day. And the question is, will we stand together to make sure that schools can do that for all kids, not just some? Will we stand together to make sure that schools are able to do that for our low-income students, for our students of color, for our English learners, for our students with disabilities? And the reality is today, we are not in Michigan on a trajectory to go up together. We are on a trajectory truth be told, to go down together. You heard the mayor talk about the trajectory of performance in Michigan. The reality that here, as in many places around the country, the kids who need the most get the least. Less access to quality pre-K, less access to a well-rounded education that includes science and social studies and the arts. Less access to effective teachers. Less access to school counselors less access to advanced coursework like AP classes or even chemistry and physics. That too often in Michigan, as in many places around the country, those opportunity gaps then translate into achievement gaps. And the achievement gaps are stark. We know, for example, that from 2003 to 2017, Michigan slipped from being ranked 28th to being ranked 35th in the country for fourth grade reading performance. We know that eighth grade math performance stagnated over the same period, ranking Michigan 33rd in the country. We know that the gaps between students of color and white students are enormous, unacceptably large. In fact, white students in Michigan are about three times as likely as black students to be proficient in reading. But the reality is white students aren't a great benchmark, actually, in Michigan. In point of fact, white eighth graders are ranked in the bottom 10 states in the country in math, and white fourth graders are ranked in the bottom five states in reading. We are not on a trajectory to go up together. We are on a trajectory to go down together. But it doesn't have to be that way. We know that there are places around the country that are demonstrating that progress is possible. And they're doing that because they are clear that the future depends on the success of our education system. Consider that nearly half of Michigan students are in families eligible for free reduced price lunch. More than a quarter of Michigan students are students of color. Michigan, it is true for Michigan as it is for the country. If we fail to educate low-income students and students of color, we have no future. The states that have grappled with that reality are making the necessary changes to go up together rather than down together. I think about Massachusetts, where a coalition of business leaders and civil rights leaders and educators came together in the early 90s to say that the performance of the state was not good enough. There was a need to make a significant investment of additional resources, along with careful attention to the development of teachers and principals, and meaningful accountability for the dollars spent. The Massachusetts 1993 Reform Act ushered in a period of work on higher standards for teaching and learning that has led Massachusetts to be number one in the country in performance. Massachusetts, indeed, is competitive with even our strongest international competitors. It is not to say they've solved every problem in Massachusetts. They still have their achievement gaps. But the resolute partnership, again, of the business community and the civil rights community was critical to laying the foundation for improvement. In higher education, I think about the work that's happened in Tennessee, 
where you have a Republican governor, Republican legislature. This isn't about partisanship. This is about policy. There you have a Republican governor, Republican legislature who understand that the future of Tennessee depends on having a prepared workforce. And so the governor of Tennessee committed to the idea of a drive to 55 and has everyone across all sectors, higher ed, business, K-12, talking about the importance of getting to 55% of adults in Tennessee having a college degree. They've made college free, community college tuition free for students who graduate from high school. And this year they expanded with Tennessee Reconnect their community college promise. So now working adults know if they want to go back to community college, they can do so for free. But Tennessee isn't just putting dollars in. They're also focused on completion. What are the, what's the mentoring? What's the support that students need to actually not just get to college, but finish college? They realize, as we all must, the sad reality that for every 10 students who start college, for every 10 white students who start college, six will have graduated six years later. For every 10 Latino students who start college, five will have graduated six years later. And for African-American students, just four. Right, we have a completion challenge, not just an access challenge. Tennessee understands that, so they're making investments in completion. They know they have work to do to get to their goals. And they can look to examples around the country, places like the City University of New York, which has a program called ASAP, which has doubled completion rates in community college through a mix of supports, academic advising, metro cards, subway cards that help students with transportation, just-in-time grants, because so many students face obstacles around food insecurity, housing insecurity, or just needing to pay bills in their family that they have to choose to pay instead of continuing college. And so what CUNY has done is put in time a just-in-time grants program, put in place a just-in-time grants program to help those students stay in school. And Tennessee is learning from that. They're learning from places like Georgia State, which has a proactive advising strategy that's helped them close the nearly close the graduation rate gap for African-American students, Latino students, and low-income students. They're learning from Georgia State's example, which is, again, around intrusive advising, or what I sometimes call nagging, right? Where someone calls you and says, I see you signed up for these courses. Do you realize this course that you signed up for actually won't count towards your major and won't get you closer to graduation? Someone calls you up at Georgia State and says, I saw that you didn't do well in the midterm. What's your plan? Right, all the things that each of us would do for our kids, Georgia State understands they need to do for their students, particularly those who are first generation college students. And Tennessee is learning from their example. These are the things we have to do if we want to go up together, not down together. So from Massachusetts to Tennessee, from CUNY to Georgia State, there are places that are doing it differently because they are committed to better outcomes. There are three things I want to suggest that those places have in common. One, folks have stepped up to lead. They aren't playing the blame game. They aren't saying, well, it's K-12's fault, not higher ed's fault. Well, it's the business community's fault. Well, it's a mayor's fault versus the governor's fault versus the legislature's fault. In all of those places, you've had people say, we're going to take responsibility for changing the outcomes. We can make a difference. Second, in all of those places, they've worked across sectors. They've built alliances between the business community, the civil rights community, the practitioner community. And they've reached out to faith leaders. They've reached out to community-based organizations to work in partnership. And third, in all these places, people are holding themselves accountable for results and maintaining a sense of urgency about getting better. They don't rest on their laurels. They don't say, well, we've made a lot of progress, so we're going to stop. They say, we've made a lot of progress. What are we going to do next to accelerate that progress? So I want to argue today that Michigan can choose a different path. It's a question of choices. It's a question of values. It's a question of, will we say, all of us, that we have a stake in the child down the street, down the road, in the next community over, on the other side of the state? Do we have a stake in their success as much as we have in our own community's children? If we all say that, if we all stand for the success of all kids, we have that chance to go up together, not down. We have to 
commit that school choice matters, but school choice has to come with accountability. We have to commit that adequate resources matter, but they have to be equitably distributed across school districts and within school districts. We have to commit to a policy vision that, that lifts up our educators, sees them as critical to the long-term success of our young people, and we have to commit that we are going to have a seamless integrated system between early learning, K-12, and higher ed. All of that is achievable. All of that is possible if we're willing to do it. Returning to, to Dr. King, he asked people to stand together for what is right, what is just. He presented them with that choice, go up together or go down together. He understood that our problems as a society, as a country, are interconnected, that we can't just worry about our little corner, that our fates are bound up together. And he asked the community to stand with the sanitation workers with that conviction that bettering their lives would better the condition of the community. Dr. King would say to his children, and he would reflect often on worrying about whether or not he was doing enough to help his children understand their privilege growing up as his children. And he would say that what he would tell his children is that your lives will never be, never be, what they ought to be. If the lives of others, the lives of your peers, if the lives of children who have less aren't what they ought to be, that your best future rests with the success of others, not just your own success. That's the, the reason he used that parable of the Good Samaritan. Right? It's the understanding. It's not about me. It's about we, what we can achieve together, the community that we can build. And so, this moment, and I hope this conversation today about education is a conversation about Michigan making the choice to go up together, not down together, making the choice to invest in the success of all kids for believing. It's a conversation about believing that all kids can succeed if we make the right investments and policy judgments. Certainly at Ed Trust, we stand ready to be a source of support and assistance in that effort. It's been a pleasure to talk with you all, and I look forward to the conversation. We've watched our placement in the state of Michigan across the board go down mm -hmm. over the last 20 years. What can we copy from other states that have actually been below us and now have surpassed us? Yeah. What do they do? Yeah. Well, one is about investment, right? So if you think back to that Massachusetts 93 Reform Act, they, they coupled in increased investment, particularly in their highest needs communities, with real accountability. And the accountability meant a willingness to intervene when schools or districts were struggling. It meant uh, providing professional development to teachers and principals so that they would understand the best strategies, the best evidence around how to help kids succeed, and they sustain that commitment over a 25-year period. You know, that, to me, that is the lesson, that you've got to both invest and have meaningful accountability, and you've got to know that educators are the linchpin to the strategy. 80 to 90 percent of what we spend in schools is spent on people. If you don't strengthen teacher and principal quality, you're not going to get better outcomes. In Michigan, and maybe elsewhere too, uh, the charter schools have been kind of the third rail. There are people in this audience who can't stand charter schools. There are people in this audience who love charter schools. We don't always talk about how good the schools may or may not be and how successful. Did you start your charter school in Boston? Yeah. And a very high performing charter school. Tell yeah. me a yeah. little about that. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I became a teacher because of the difference that teachers had made in my own life. Uh, but I was frustrated at times that the schools where I had worked weren't doing the things that I thought mattered most for high needs kids. So I created my own school and that's why it was a charter because that was the, the best path to create a school that looked the way I wanted. That had the schedule I wanted, that had the team that I wanted. I liked that bargain of autonomy for greater accountability. So I started a charter called Roxbury Prep in Boston, very high needs school. Uh, nearly all of our kids were students of color, nearly all of our kids were eligible for free or reduced price lunch, and we became the highest performing urban school in the state. 
Right? And we leverage the, the autonomy around teacher selection, around our schedule, to make a difference for kids. But I would say part of the charter story in a place like Massachusetts is about meaningful accountability. Massachusetts has a high bar to get a charter, a willingness to closely monitor performance, and a willingness to close charters that are low performing. I, I couldn't hear everything backstage, and I don't know if Dr. King revealed to you his background. He lost both of his parents by the time he was 12, and yet, without any extra help or privileges, if you will, worked very hard. That's why you said you cared about what the teachers did, because mm -hmm. teachers helped you specifically very mm -hmm. much, and then off to Harvard. Mm -hmm. What makes you different than any of us in that regard with people who've come up with all kinds of excuses for ourselves for not achieving? Yeah. Well, you know, I think the reality is a lot of it is luck, right? If I had had a different teacher in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, I think I'd be dead today or I'd be in prison. Really? It's the honest truth. But how in the Mis world? Mr. Osterweil saved my life because he saw that there was a reason to invest in me. Look, I've, I've worked hard and I, you know, all of those things, but it, it's in an instant that kids' lives change. Everybody should spend time in a juvenile justice facility and talk to young people there, or in a prison and talk to young people who are incarcerated. And what you hear over and over again is a split second decision. Wrong place, wrong time. Hey, will you go to this convenience store with me? Turns out your friend's playing to rob the convenience store. Now you're standing there. Now you're in prison. And what society says is we're done with you. Right? That could, could easily have been me. The other thing I, that, I, that, I, that I didn't mention is I was kicked out of high school. The first secretary of education had been kicked out of high school. Um, <laughs> but like many young people, I had experienced trauma, and so I was angry. I was angry at adults, I was angry at my parents to some extent, I was just angry, and I got in trouble. And again, people could have given up on me, but such a blessing that I had some family members, some mentors, and teachers who said, no, no, we're gonna give you a second chance. So a lot of it is luck. I was blessed to have people who gave me those chances, who saw potential. I saw Dr. Schlissel up here on the stage, and I see him still out there in the audience, Doctor, uh, from University of Michigan, one of our finest mm -hmm. colleges, one of the greatest colleges in America, and I know that because you couldn't get into Michigan, you went to Harvard. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I happened to go to Michigan, graduated from Michigan, and, and proudly so, but I had to go to community college initially because I didn't have any money to go to school. Mm -hmm. So I worked, I worked full time to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. There are now places, uh, states, I think uh, Tennessee, Oregon, Maryland, where they're offering free community college. Your thought on that? Yeah. Look, I'm hopeful about that because I do think it's powerful to be able to stand up. You know, if I think back to my time as a high school teacher, it's powerful to be able to stand up and say to kids, everyone in this class can go to college. It will be paid for. And we know that in this country we have a history. There have been states that have provided free public higher education. It is possible to do. What I worry about in the design of some of those promised programs, two things. One, not attending enough to the other supports that students need. Right? Students need academic support. They need good counseling and advising, particularly first generation students. They may need additional financial support to pay for books, to pay for transportation. So I worry that some of the programs are not designed with attention to completion, because that's really the question, not just well, the students start, do they finish? That, if we take away anything right now, let's take that away. That's attention right. to completion. That's right. We appreciate that's it. Right. I won't have an opportunity to do this, and with the 35 seconds left I have, I do want us all to thank uh, Wendy Nodge, behind the scenes, Tammy Karnreich, behind the scenes, Bev Maddox, and of course, Sandy Baru on the Greater Detroit Regional Chamber. They have done a tremendous job, as I think you'll agree, so has Dr. John B. King. Thanks. Good job, man.